Contrary to the heritage of Bangladesh, a particular political party with ill-motivated agenda, along with some followers of leftist ideology, have been working behind the scene to demolish Bangladesh's image as a secular and tolerant country. They believe branding Bangladesh with Islamic terrorism would open new doors of opportunities for them, both by manipulating voters in the national elections and convincing donors in the global community. In an uncertain scenario, where much of the information seem to come out of a propaganda campaign, where most of the political claims do not seem to match the evident facts, in today's Bangladesh, there are a few questions raised by the onlooking populace. When did the so-called Islamic terrorism begin in Bangladesh? What is the agenda of the terrorist organizations? Who facilitate them from behind? and who fight against them for real. Who are the beneficiaries and who are the sufferers? To find the answers, we should first look into the backdrop of the rise of the so-called Islamic terrorism in Bangladesh. Most of the supposed radical organizations, including Jamatul Mujahideen Bangladesh GMB and Harkatul Jihad Bangladesh, were formed after the Awami League government assumed office in 1996. The terrorists received the then government's patronization in every possible means, from giving their birth to encouraging their growth, from allowing their bomb blasts to ensuring their safety. The Awami League committed to them direct and indirect support in all strategic and operational areas. Their goal was to relate Islamic terrorism with the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, the MP, through a publicity campaign and create anarchy using their own terrorists, so that all blames of the instability could be directed towards the BNP. In many cases, top Awami League leaders were found personally or politically linked with the terrorist leaders. For example, the founder of the most notorious terrorist organization, JMB, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, was the brother-in-law of the then parliamentarian Mirza Azam. Even after having a close public relationship with a terrorist like Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Mirza Azam was not held responsible by the Awami League, nor was he disowned by the party. Instead, he got nomination in the 2008 election, eventually got elected, became a parliament whip, and rose to the general secretary position of the Juba League, the youth front of the Awami League. The whole nation got furious and wanted to know, why would association with terrorists lead to elevation in politics for Awami League leaders? In March 1999, when the Awami League was in power and 2001 national election was in the eyesight, several bombs exploded in Joshur at a function organized by Udichi Shilpokoshti. Ten died and over hundreds severely injured. The first incident of this kind it warned the nation about the potential rise of terrorism and led to huge domestic and international protests. The Awami League government accused its political oppositions and stayed away from taking strong measures. Be that in the form of tightening the security, launching quick legal actions or initiating meticulous investigation. The government's passive support through stillness and inactivity led to another terrorist attack in Kulna within six months. The bombing took place in a mosque and claimed eight religious Muslims who historically campaigned against the Awami League. Soon after, seven died and hundreds were injured in a similar attack at a rally of the Communist Party in Dhaka, who were outspoken and vocal critics of the misrule of the then Awami League regime. On the 14th of April 2001, the perpetrators carried out bomb blasts in the Bengali New Year in Rauna Batamul of Dhaka.
killing 11 people and injuring hundreds. In instant reaction, without any investigation, the government held its oppositions responsible. While their blame game continued to hide the truth and hold others responsible for their own misdeeds, it helped the terrorists get away. Then the people had to witness another horrifying attack. This time in a church in Gopalganj, the birthplace of the then Prime Minister and Awami League President, Sheikh Hasina, as well as her father, Sheikh Munjibur Rahman, where the Sheikh family runs the administration with absolute authority and nothing happens without their approval. The attack, being masterminded by the associates of Sheikh Hasina, claimed ten lives all being followers of the Christian faith. Unfortunately, but inevitably, no proper investigation or trial took place. On the 16th of June 2001, right before the national election, another tragedy struck in the Awami League's office in Narayan Ganj. A series of bombs killed 22 activists, with none of them holding any central party position. The then local parliamentarian, Shamin Osman, widely known as a ringleader come godfather, was there too, but remained untouched. Sheikh Halal, a cousin of Sheikh Hasina, and also an incumbent of parliamentarian, escaped unhurt at an Awami League rally in Bagarhat, which killed many low-tier party activists. The survival of Shamin Osman and Sheikh Halal, without injuries, in the attacks that killed their colleagues, initiated public speculations and inquiries. On the one hand, the Wami League government was busy blaming the BNP and its allies for the attacks by relating them to the so-called Islamic extremism, and on the other hand, the common people figured out that the attacks were in essence sponsored by the government itself. In an effort to earn sympathy in the forthcoming election, as well as tarnish the image of the BNP, and its allies. The general people of Bangladesh, furious with the Awami League's support to terrorism, wanted massive change in the government and voted in favour of the BMP in 2001. The BMP, along with its political allies, went to form the government with a landslide victory of two-third majority. While the BMP government strived to establish good governance, the Awami League, as the main opposition, continued its political malculture. Indeed, it believes in negative propaganda against the country for own vested interests, whether in power or in opposition. In 2001, as part of the Wami League's media campaign, Hong Kong-based Far Eastern Economic Review newspaper published an article negatively portraying Bangladesh as an Islamist, extremist and terrorist country. It was so controversial that the newspaper's former editor, Philip Boring, published a rejoinder in another Hong Kong-based newspaper, South China Morning Post. His evidence-based arguments noted that all the data, information and stories of the Far Eastern Economic Review article were false and politically motivated. The South China Morning Post article got tremendous media coverage within Bangladesh and beyond and generated potential legal actions against the fake report. In another instance, getting confused with the local media reports and international lobbying generated by the Awami League, Reuters published fake stories of bomb blasts in Maimenshing. In its history spanning over 150 years, Reuters did such mistake for the first time and formally expressed regret about reporting the baseless news. Adding more to that, the Uwami League brought two undercover journalists from the British Channel 4 television to Bangladesh, both with false identifications, one as a tourist and the other as a teacher, with the assignment of defaming Bangladesh in the international arena through fabricated terrorism stories. The agents unexpectedly got caught by the local intelligence and apologised for the act of deception and professional misconduct. My clients intended to film a current affairs programme for Channel 4 television in the United Kingdom about Bangladesh, but conceded that they had entered the country improperly on tourist visas 
and on false professional identities. My clients have apo apologized for their act of deception and they sincerely regret any misunderstanding that their conduct may have caused. In its continuing effort to malign the BMP government while catching people's sympathy, the Uwami League conspired with the terrorists and staged a grenade attack at its own rally on the 21st of August 2004. The brutality killed 23 people. Hundreds of top-tier Awami League leaders escaped without injury, except Ivy Rahman, who was known to have long-standing tension in her relation with Sheikh Hasina. Also, it was a known fact among the mass that Ivy Rahman always preferred to sit among the activists on the ground instead of being with the top leaders on the stage, where the grenades exploded on that fateful day. The government immediately launched fair and neutral investigations involving international organizations and crime experts such as the FBI and the Scotland Yard. It received cooperation from other local and international law enforcement agencies as well and earned appreciation for taking quick initiatives. However, the Oami League did not cooperate at all harshly denying the invitation of the FBI to take part in the investigation process, not even allowing them to inspect Sheikh Hasina's car. As usual, the Uami League started blaming the government for the attack, even before the investigation could begin. In the same year, the terrorists, aided by the Uami League, carried out a nationwide series of bomb blasts. The government arrested ten topmost terrorist leaders of the country, including Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Sidiqul Islam Bangla Bahai, and Autur Rahman Sani, all of whom started terrorism and thrived during the previous Awami League tenure. A special tribunal was formed to convict them at the earliest instance, which found them guilty and sentenced to death accordingly. The BMP government launched a mass-scale manhunt through various law enforcement agencies with a view to identifying and locating the culprits behind organized crime and terrorism. It took three exemplary actions. First, banned the terrorist organizations that had sprung up during the previous Awami League tenure. Second, created an elite law enforcement force named Rapid Action Battalion. RAB, to counter terrorism through rapid and strict actions. And third, gave the judiciary absolute independence in dealing with the terrorists. For example, encouraging the death penalty of 22 notorious terrorists in one verdict. In doing so, the terrorists were apprehended for prosecution and death penalty, involving severe gun battles with the RAB as required. Although the BNP government stood firm with its zero-tolerance policy against terrorism, the Awami League kept creating social instability and political violence, exploiting the terrorists from behind the scene and manipulating public consensus through information fabrication. <laughs> When the pre-planned election results brought the Awami League to power in 2008, the government surprisingly decommissioned 60 army officers to the Bangladesh Rifles BDR, headquarter, who were previously employed in the RAB and played a vital role in uprooting terrorism. Just two months into the term, as commonly believed with strong reasons, the government conspired with the BDR mutiny. Nearly all the army officers of the BMP counter-terrorism program were killed. There were 57 martyrs, 
including some of the brightest officers of the Bangladesh Army, who fought against the terrorists during the previous BMP government's period and preserved the inside stories of the birth, growth and expansion of the Islamic extremists, which in turn posed threat to the Wami League. The way the Awami League government put together all counter-terrorism offices in one place, restrained all its politicians from being there, negotiated and handled the mutiny in real time, allowed the murderers mayhem and flee, delayed the investigation and denied justice to the victims' families, made it clear that it had involvement with the incident. The murder of the main counter-terrorism officers by the Wami League proved that it does not want a peaceful Bangladesh free from terrorist threats. Instead, it wants to foster the so-called Islamic terrorism to keep the country instable and give the blame on political oppositions. Also, it is widely speculated that the Wami League took revenge against the officers as they destroyed the creations of the Wami League including the arrest of the leading terrorist, Sheikh Abdurrahman, brother-in-law of Mirza Azam, MP. All Bangladeshis were shocked when they saw that Mirza Azam was sent to represent the government in the disgraceful negotiation with the BDR mutineers, even after holding a junior position within the parties and the government's hierarchies. There are many more stories of the Wami League's engagement with terrorism, particularly nearing the end of their tenure. In September 2012, the party activists of the Wami League vandalized the century old pagodas and temples of the Buddhist community in Cox's Bazaar, Jigon, and Teknaf. They looted and destroyed the heritage in the presence of the Home Minister and burned down houses to turn Buddhists into refugees. According to the witnesses, as well as the coverage of the popular media of the country, members of the local units of ruling Awami League were involved in it. The Sheikh Hasina government did not initiate any visible process to investigate the bloody incident. In fact, no religion is safe in the hands of the Awami League. That it is involved in religious terrorism was proved yet again in December 2012, just within few months of the Buddhist massacre, when publicly known Awami League activists chopped Vishwajat Das to death amid the most brutal murder of contemporary Bangladesh, if not the world. In spite of all the propagandas and conspiracies of the Awami League, the Bangladeshis recognize that the Awami League uses religion as a strategic weapon, not ideologically, but hypocritically, and that too for the sake of power and politics. While the Awami League claims itself a secular party with religious tolerance, should we consider killing all races and religions, from Muslims to Hindus, from Christians to Buddhists, as secularism? Does secularism mean the promotion of extremism and terrorism in the name of Islamism? Does religious tolerance mean the activation of anarchy? Does religious tolerance mean the launch of blame games as a political card? The truth needs to be told. And the time has come to unfold it. <laughs>